showed you the catapults, and every once in a while you fire that catapult, and for some reason, either the catapult malfunctioned, or the engines in the aircraft didn't quite work right, that aircraft would go down in the water, and there's going to be a destroyer, a small ship called a plane guard destroyer, that's going to come in and do their best to rescue the crew of that aircraft before it sinks down in the water and is lost, okay? Later that day, or the next day, that destroyer would come back alongside the carrier and hopefully send the air crew back to the carrier. The thing was, back in World War II, destroyers did not have the space to be able to have ice cream machines. They didn't have it on board. So when you were sending the air crew back to the carrier, the carrier had to pay. They had to pay for that air crew. <laughs> the going rate for an aviator in World War II was five gallons of ice cream. Okay. <laughs> you laugh, but at the same time, that's how a lot of things get done in the military. Okay. It depends on the rank of the person. USS Enterprise lost their air group commander. Uh, his name was Killer Kane. And he was gone for a number of days. They thought they lost him until the destroyer comes alongside the Enterprise. And this is the old, old World War II Enterprise. And flashes its signal light. How much ice cream can we get for Killer Kane? The Enterprise ended up paying 20 gallons, four times the going rate for that one person. Just because the Enterprise missed him so much. Okay? That's how things happen. There's a lot of stories around here. That underground economy that's happening. So, uh, any questions in here at all? Okay. All right. Let's head this way. this, I have a gentleman from the Coast Guard. space on fire and you have to walk into this burning space and put it out. And then what they did, when you were all the way in that space, they'd throw a switch and the whole place goes up in flames again and you have to basically work your way out. Okay, so it was kind of interesting to go through as a teenager in doing that. Okay, so that's an OBA. Okay, those cans that you just uh, are looking at, this is a protein-based liquid uh, that forms what's known as fog foam. So if you need to fight an oil-based fire, you're going to be spraying this. It's like a foam and it's going to smother that fire. And these cans, basically, uh, you could either use them individually or there's hoppers up above. Say if you had a hangar deck fire, you could be pouring this stuff into the hoppers and then that's going to be going for the fire stuff. They used to tell us also it's a protein-based liquid. If you need to abandon ship.
chip, you could grab a can of this stuff and live off of it. But if you ever smelled it, you I think I do not want that alternative. I, I, trying to get 10 guys on a life raft and live off of this would not be very good. Okay. It stinks. It really, I mean, 10 times worse than cod liver oil, if you know what that smells like. Okay. So, any questions?
to know what flight deck is made out of? Wood. 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 Teak and Douglas fir. You drop a bomb on that flight deck, chances are it's going to go through. It goes down to the hangar deck. Hangar deck is armored. Bomb goes off. That's where you're actually fueling and you're arming the aircraft. There were some ships like USS Franklin of this class in World War II that had infernos because basically those bombs went through into that hangar deck. Okay? Sailors have a lot of superstition and you can have a concept of a lucky ship or an unlucky ship. This ship, the Hornet, was a lucky ship. The Franklin was an unlucky ship. Not only in one case did they take bombs off the coast of Japan, they came back, got repaired, went back to Japan, and at that point then they took kamikazes, and the same thing happened to them. But, because of the design that we see here, even though they had the major, major attacks on the ship, every ship survived. Okay. 24 of these were built in World War II. None of them, none of them were sunk of this class, the Essex class. Okay. By the way, a bunch of the work done building these ships, uh, female labor. Okay, Rosie the Riveters, Wanda the Welders and all, because a lot of the guys were overseas fighting. So the uh, industrial workforce kind of opened up a little bit during that time. Okay. And how much time does it take to build a ship? Uh, this particular one was 15 months. Nowadays, uh, the latest one that they built, uh, USS Gerald R. Ford, I think it's five years. And last I heard was something on the order of $15 billion. Now, I should have mentioned when I was in Catapult that Gerald R. Ford has a unique way now of launching aircraft. Instead of using hydraulic like we have, or later ships have steam, okay, Gerald R. Ford is using magnetism magnetic induction in a ram underneath the deck, and that magnetic ram is throwing the aircraft off the ship. Okay, so pretty cool. I mean, it's next generation catapult. Okay. Is it nuclear power? Do we have nuclear power? Oh, yeah. Yeah, no, they're all nuclear power. Now the big ones are all nuclear power. Yeah. So after, uh, you know, 63, 1964, that's when the Enterprise came in, the first nuclear-powered aircraft carrier. Uh, most of the large ones after that have all been nuclear. And the Enterprise and the nuclear ships, pretty much, in terms of fuel, they can operate for something like 20 years on a fuel load before they have to go back in and be refueled. Instead of us on ships like this needing a tanker to come out you know, every few days to be able to give you more fuel. Uh, let me show you something else here, right here in this diagram. We're going to go down into the forward engine room and looking primarily at the number one engine right there in that generator right there. As we go down, we're going to be going below the water line. You see that heavy dark line right there? That's the water line of the ship. And so we're going to be below the water. Now you're in my kind of territory. <laughs> an awful lot of time in these places. So this is the type of port station you have at Midway, the size of it. Well, on the Midway it was a little bit different because what happened was each engine had its own engine room. Uh -huh. In here we have two engines in this one space. Okay, Midway was a little bit more of a, uh, what they call a battleship design. Uh -huh. uh, Midway had more fire room. Uh, Midway also, you're right in front of a generator right there. Yeah. Uh, Hornet had four of those, the Midway has eight. Okay, so a lot more uh, flexibility and a lot more protection. Okay. Built into it. The problem was that the Midway got designed during World War II, mm -hmm. and the aircraft carriers were taking such a beating that basically they knew they had to go to a more robust design to be able to withstand the attacks. Going on. Okay. Okay. So uh, everybody, come on over this way. We're going to talk for a minute.
Ten years. Ten years. Yeah, I started working here about ten years ago. Uh, okay, we have everybody down? Yeah. Okay, very good. Welcome to the engine room. Where you are standing now, you're maybe about 20 feet below sea level. Okay, we're standing in front of one of the ship's four main engines, also known as Shirley. Sailor artwork. Shirley was a lady in the Philippines that a sailor really liked, and so the sailor came back on board and painted her name on the engine. And if Shirley is still around, and I hope she is, I don't know if she knows she has an engine named after her, but she would now be a senior citizen in the Philippines. Okay? What's happening down here is you have steam being produced in your boilers coming to your high pressure turbine at 600 pounds and pressure in 850 degrees coming through to your low pressure turbine in your crossover pipe it's about 50 pounds pressure the steam comes through here expands through the turbine plating you can see some of it right there and then it goes down to a main condenser down below your main condenser has about 4,000 tubes running through it that are carrying seawater through, cooling the last of that steam and turning it into water or condensate. Okay? Your main condenser is going to be operating at about 29 and a half inches of vacuum. So if you think about it, 600 pounds coming in, 50 pounds through the crossover, and a vacuum down below, all the energy from that steam is being imparted to these turbines. That turbine at full speed can be operating at about 5,700 RPM. This one, 4,000 and something RPM. They're linked via shaft into what's known as a reduction gear. Right there. You can't spin your propeller at 5,000 RPM, so the reduction gear reduces it down gears it down so the maximum speed on the shaft and propeller is going to be about 252 rpm and if all four main engines are doing that the ship will be doing in world war ii time 33 knots which is about 36 miles an hour okay a little bit later on when they modified the ship they made it a bit heavier with flight deck modifications and things the top speed went down to about 30 or 31 knots Okay. Each engine capable of 37,500 horsepower, and you had four of these engines, so basically the ship's shaft horsepower was 150,000 horsepower. All right. <laughs> Questions at all? Okay. Once you're done in your turbines, you turn it back into water in your main condenser. Condensate pump picks it up. Air ejector is basically trying to remove the air out of the condenser and support the vacuum. Come back over to what's known as a deaerating feed tank. That is removing dissolved gases from the uh, water that you have. Once you take that, you send it back to the fire room and they make steam again. So it's a continuous circular process of making the steam, using it to do work, and then turning it back into water, treating it, sending it back to the fire room. Okay? Alrighty, I'm going to take you over on that side, so I need to suck through here. This, by the way, is one of the ship's four generators for electricity. 1,250 kilowatt, if anyone here is interested in that.
The throttle is going to come over to the engine order telegraph, meet whatever the change is, acknowledge to the bridge, and come here to the throttle and be admitting more or less steam to meet whatever the change is. Okay. You can't make this change instantaneously. You have to keep your steam pressure consistent. If you come over here, for example, and they say slow down or stop, and you have an inexperienced throttleman, and they do this, that steam has nowhere to go. The safety relief valve starts <coughs> blowing open on top of that boiler. They shut the boiler down. This whole area goes dark. It would be the responsibility of this poor person. Similarly, if they come, they call down here and they say go fast, and this person doesn't think about it, what's going to happen is your steam pressure is going to drop. At 590 pounds, you lose your generator. Once again, everything goes dark. It's all on the shoulders of this poor 18-year-old that's right here. They could shut down this part of the ship. So hopefully they have enough training to be able to not do that and enough supervision. By the way, the little desk or table where you are right there, that would be where the engineering officer of the watch would have been. And it would have taken a total crew of about nine people underway to be able to operate this engine room, both engines. Okay. And there is a level below us, too. There would have been a couple people down there in addition to the seven that we're working with here. Okay? Uh, bring people as they're coming through here. People work on a watch schedule around the clock, and so they had to keep this open most hours. They'd open up here for breakfast around 4 in the morning, and they'd work their way through lunch and dinner. And for those people coming on watch at midnight or getting off watch at midnight, they'd have what were known as mid-rats or midnight rations. So basically, they wouldn't stop serving here around 2 o'clock in the morning. And then they're up running again about 4 o'clock in the morning. Okay. And the mess deck's back behind me. I don't think we're go that we'll go there because it's getting late in the day. <coughs> There's three separate compartments of seating over there for the sailors to be able to eat. Sit and eat. Okay. Food was generally pretty good, but it depended upon how long you were out at sea. After a week or 10 days, just about everything that was fresh went away. Okay, you lose your fresh milk, you lose your fresh eggs, fruits and vegetables. You end up with powdered milk, powdered eggs, things out of cans, things that are frozen, beans, you know, things like that. So, uh, But then it doesn't really change much until you get back into your next port, which can be a long time. So hopefully you've got some good cooks able to uh, at least improvise a little. This also, I'm going to give a little bit of an advertisement, especially if any of you know any youth. We do overnights on board, and this is the chow line. We actually feed people here. On some weekend nights, we have up to 500 people sleeping on board. I'm part of the group that does that, and this is one of the lines where we actually feed people. So if any of you are interested in doing a night on the Hornet, or if you know any youth that might want to do that, uh, feel free to send them in our direction. If any of you feel like volunteering on board, either being a docent or restoration or anything like that, we can use the help too. So let us know. Any questions about the food? Make sure you have a lot of beans in you. A lot of beans. SOS. Okay. SOS. The polite term is uh, stuff on a shingle. It's also known as creamed chip beef on toast. Okay, so, and it's made with this kind of, it's almost like a leather that they soak in the water to reconstitute it, and then they put a cream sauce on it, and then they serve it over toast. Okay, so, so that's a staple. I mean, uh, some people I know in the Navy actually still love the idea of SOS. I can't get my wife to even think of the idea of trying it in our house. All right, let's go around the corner just one more time.
basically get the stewards to cook for them. So basically, uh, a lot of different places were involved in the ship in food preparation, but this is the main one right here. Okay. Uh, breads, pizzas, pastries, all that type of thing. There was a Hornet captain who really loved donuts. At that time, the deep fryer was put in over in the corner. So the ship was capable of donuts at that point.